Please have open in front of you Romans chapter 11, and we're going to be thinking about verses 33 to 36, Paul's great doxology. And let's bow our heads and pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we simply want to once again humble ourselves before you. We are sinners, O Lord, we are inadequate in every way, Lord, to set forth, Lord, who you are. Father, we really pray for the ministry of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Lord, that these moments may not be empty or wasted, but Lord, rather in a wonderful way, in your grace, we might feel something of the weight the beautiful weight of your glory come upon us and our lives may be reshaped. Bless us, O Lord, we need your imprint upon us every day. Please help us, Lord, now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The great physicist Albert Einstein died in 1955. One scientist writes of his own and Einstein's attitude toward religion like this. Quote, I do see the design of the universe as an essentially religious question. One should have respect and awe for the whole business. It's very magnificent. In fact, that is why Einstein, that is why I believe why Einstein had so little use for organized religion although he strikes me as a basically very religious man. He must have looked at what preachers said about God and felt they were blaspheming. He had seen so much more majesty in the cosmos than they ever seemed to have imagined, and they were just not talking about the real thing. My guess is that he simply felt that religions he had run across did not have a proper respect for the author of the universe. End of quote. Now, when I first read those words, I felt very challenged. Very challenged. That should challenge us, shouldn't it? Here's the man, Einstein, great theoretical physicist understanding something of the majesty, the enormous majesty of the universe that God made. And then he hears some guy in the pulpit rattling on as if God is just anybody. At root, the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century was based on a heartfelt passion to restore God to his rightful position of glory and majesty in people's thinking. For hundreds of years, the church had fixed its eyes really on itself to make itself powerful and magnificent, great cathedrals, royal robes and all that kind of thing, really leading to the church's corruption. Simultaneously, you remember your history, the Renaissance with its exaltation of ancient learning, the arts, the human body had swept through Europe. Man was centre stage. So when the friar Johann Tetzel began to sell indulgences to build St. Peter's in Rome, supposedly for the forgiveness of relatives, supposedly in purgatory, Martin Luther saw, it seems to me, that this was not only a distortion of the gospel, but it was a reducing of God himself to some greedy little deity dependent on our money. And out of deep spiritual distress, concern for the glory of God, he nailed those 95 theses to the door in the church door in Wittenberg on the 31st of October 1517. And all unforeseen. Thus, the earth-shaking 
Reformation exploded across Europe, reshaping society. So it is that among the five solas or solis, onlys, which traditionally summarise the Reformation, we find soli deo gloria, Latin for glory to God alone. And the concern was to dethrone proud celebrity man and exalt God. And unless Christians in every age rejoice in and are driven by that same sentiment, then church reduces to a ritual followed by a cup of coffee. And thinking men and women like Albert Einstein see it as verging on blasphemy. Do you know this God? Do you know who you're talking about? Now in Romans 11 verses 33 to 36, there's a very, very different spirit to such superficiality. There we find the Apostle Paul exalting God. We can imagine him prostrate before the Lord as he contemplates the breathtaking vision of the all-glorious God. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And catch something of the spirit of Paul here. So tonight we're going to be thinking about glory to God alone. We're going to be thinking a little bit about our God, the true God, the God who did make the universe. And let's try to humbly get alongside Paul in these verses and just get a glimpse in God's goodness, a glimpse of that glory ourselves. First, we find here in these verses a God beyond understanding a god beyond understanding that's our first heading paul begins his doxology oh the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of god paul is saying with awe oh the depths of almighty god he's saying this of course as he concludes the doctrinal section of Romans, perhaps his, his greatest epistle. He has explained some astonishing things. He has explained the sin of both Jews and Gentiles, the wickedness of overt iniquity, the proud hypocrisy of religious conformity, and yet which damns people to hell. And yet through the cross of his son, the Lord Jesus, God has solved this at a stroke. Oh, the depths of who God is and what God does. He has contemplated the charge that God's word to his Old Testament covenant people had failed. The majority of Jews did not believe. But what looks like failure actually results as it were, in the expansion of God's mercy to both Jews and Gentiles. Chapter 11, verse 32. Oh, the depths of what God has done. It looks one way, but actually, it's another. What God does has so many depths. I, I was thinking, I think about this sometimes. In his judgment, the, the flood, in his judgment, mercy. Ah, where, where did all those fossil fuels come from that we run our cars on? Oh, it's, isn't, that, isn't that what we believe? All those 
creatures that have, and those forests that have, were under the judgment of the flood. That was a great judgment. And yet in that judgment, God was making provision for generations to come, for the world to be fueled. All the depths of what God does. Astonishing. And you'll notice that in all this there is riches. This is not just cleverness, but grace, goodness, beauty. If you like, like an Einstein equation. In verse 34, Paul cites Isaiah 40. And in that chapter, God asked, to whom will you liken me? Who is my equal? But of course, there's no one. No one. We thank God for what he's revealed to us in scripture about himself. But there is more to the being of God. To his Trinitarian nature. To his attributes. To his character. To his ways than we could ever possibly take in. So Paul is saying, oh, the depths. Notice Paul ponders the incomprehensibility of God along four lines. Verse 33, he knows everything. There is no fact or detail, past, present or future, that God does not know. His wisdom, secondly, is perfect. In other words, God knows the best way to use his knowledge to the best ends. He knows how to to bring good out of every situation. God's judgments, there it's unsearchable judgments. God's judgments, in other words, his kingly decrees, his eternal plans to exalt his son, the Lord Jesus, who has served him. (coughs) To exalt his son, the Lord Jesus, in the salvation of his people. These things are greater than we can take in, unsearchable. And finally, there are his paths, his ways. You remember how Isaiah puts it. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So Paul is, is, is like, if you like, like Galileo, looking through his telescope, and yeah, he sees, uh, I don't know, the rings of Saturn or whatever, but then he sees beyond, and then he realises that there's far more, far, far more, all oh, the depths of the universe. Oh, the depths of God. Far beyond us. Intricacies, unusual turns in his providence that often leave us with open mouths. Sometimes foolishly we are so taken aback that we wonder if God knows what he's doing, but of course he knows what he's doing. So Paul says, oh, the depth, oh, the rich depths. And we are humbled by the greatness of God beyond understanding. And sometimes we can see strange things that God does. In my mind, as I've been thinking about this message, into my mind comes uh, a woman who was part of our church. She's now with the Lord. But sadly, she was not well, and eventually she went deaf. And you might think, God, why have you done that? Well, very interestingly, he opened a door for her into the deaf community in Guildford. So she began to have meetings in her home. And people would come and hear something of the gospel every Christmas and things like that. It was a strange providence. But God knew what he was doing. 
Another thing comes to my mind, which is, please, uh, I, I, this is in many ways nothing to do with me, but the very first book that I ever, booklet that I ever wrote was published was a thing called Coming to Faith in Christ. And when it was published by the Banner of Truth, there was a f- picture on the front, which I, I didn't have any, I didn't have any consultation with me about. It was a, a picture by uh, an American uh, painter of the 19th century, I think, called Homer Winslow. And it was a picture of um, uh, herring fishing. These men were hauling the nets into their boat. What's that got to do with anything? Well, just a few weeks ago, I, you know, a guy came to me, and he's a guy from Scotland. He came to me and he said, you know that book of yours? Booklet. Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, well, it was strangely used by God for the conversion of my father. He said, my father was a, a hard Scottish fisherman, not interested in the gospel at all, not at all, getting old. But then he just liked the picture on the front of your book. <laughs> and he read it, and within a few months was converted. And then with a year, within a year, he died. What a strange thing. What a strange thing, just using the picture on the front of the book. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. And we should have an awe upon us. And little church... That God is your God. Your God. Second, we see here a God beyond containing, a God beyond controlling. Notice that in verse 35, Paul quotes from Job, who has ever given to God that God should repay him. God doesn't have to borrow anything from anybody. He needs no one because he is sovereign, all-powerful, and therefore uncontainable by anything or anyone. Remember how this is put in uh, Job chapter 38. Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades... Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their season or lead out the bear and its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? God is indeed the great maker of the universe. Let's do some physics. Light travels at 5.87 trillion miles a year. That's a light year. 5.87 trillion miles. And our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years across. And it is one of a million galaxies within the optical range of strong telescopes. But there are millions beyond the range of optical telescopes. And Paul writes in verse 36, From him and through him and to him are all things. Now scientists know such things. And so they say to us, if your God made this astonishing universe, how awesome he must be. How can you ever treat him lightly? And dear Christian, we are challenged. Does our demeanour match our claims to know this God. There's the great challenge, isn't it? But little church, 
He is your Father, your Father in heaven. And his uncontainable sovereignty also means that he's answerable to no one. This comes over powerfully, doesn't it, in the book of Job. Job suffers so much. And understandably, Job demands an explanation. But God doesn't give one. Not to Job. We behave as if sometimes as if God were accountable to us, as if he owes us an explanation. But he doesn't. He is sovereign. Do we take that on board? Now let me hasten to add that in his sovereignty, God is good. Though the explanation of what's going on is never given to Job, yet there is an explanation of Job's suffering given in the book to us, the reader. Yeah? What's going on? God, please, what is going on in my life? The explanation is given to the reader. Job has actually been given the great privilege of defending and suffering for God's glory in answer to Satan's accusations. Chapter 1 and 2 of Job, Satan's accusation, people only serve you, people like Job only serve you, God, for what they can get out of you. Take those things away and you'll, he'll curse you. And though Job is given no explanation, that's what's going on. And my dear friends, I don't know what's going on sometimes with little churches. But sometimes there may be something going on, as was going on with Job, that was crucial in spiritual warfare, as it were, in, in defending the glory of God. Will these people still serve me and worship me and, and meet on Sundays and sing my praise when the whole town thinks they're lunatics and everyone is against them? Well, yes, we will. To the glory of God. Yes, we will. You see? And of course, those Job is given no explanation. And of course, at the end, his wealth and his family joys overflow because God is good. And when it comes to salvation, God uses all that he is to rescue a multitude that no man can number out of sin and hellish destruction because he is good. But why doesn't he save all, we ask? And the sovereign does not answer to us. He gives us no answer. But he's good. And we are humbled because he's not accountable to us. So we are humbled and joyful and fearfully awestruck simultaneously. A God beyond containing, beyond controlling. How inadequate the preacher is to try and convey something of this. Thirdly, a God beyond praising. A God beyond understanding, a God beyond containing, a God beyond praising. Because Paul says there, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. The maker and sustainer of all, that he's the purpose of all things. And so great is his worth that he is not to be given glory simply for a moment or for an hour, but forever. Beyond praising, so it has to be for eternity. 
And this comes from Paul's heart. He's not saying this because it's the right thing to say, but because he feels it, his whole being is behind his words. To say that Paul is satisfied in God, delighted in him, is true, but it's a huge understatement. <laughs> a huge understatement. And perhaps we grasp this more firmly as we look at Jesus. For this God is Jesus. And so this astonishing God is also a humble God. How can that be? How can that be? How can that be? A humble God. This God is also the Lamb who in the dereliction of Calvary's cross takes away the sin of the world. The God of love. And the cross is not God holding his nose and simply getting a dirty job out of the way which he doesn't really want to do. It is God doing what he did want to do. And it reveals his deepest heart, glorious beyond imagination. That this God should want to do that for sinners like us. Oh, the depths. To him be the glory. We feel with Paul, to him be the glory forever. To him and no one else. How ridiculous, how blasphemous for anyone else to have the glory. We have this vision of this great God. He's your God. He's my God. Praise God. What does this mean for us? Many, far too many things that we can ever put together. But let me just try to make some practical applications here. What does this mean? First of all, it means dedication. It must lead to dedication. That's where Paul goes first, isn't it? After this great doxology, therefore, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy and realize it's this God I'm talking about this great God, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual, reasonable act of worship. Perhaps there are young people here who are not yet saved. Who else should you possibly live your life for? Who else should you possibly give your life to the stupidities of stuff that you see on the internet or this celebrity or that celebrity please don't do that young people there's only one who deserves your life this great God the best way to live your life to find your life is to offer your life as a living sacrifice to the one who was sacrificed for you as a sinner. Dedication. And to be used up in his work is the greatest way to spend your life, the greatest privilege. So one, dedication. Secondly, humility. Humility. What does this mean for us? It should mean humility. We live now, don't we, in a so-called celebrity culture where we are forever encouraged to have inflated views of ourselves. But there is nothing that will put us in our place and pull you out of that ungodly arrogance like a glimpse of who God really is. And as we see ourselves 
are so sinful that the only way of rescue was for this God to be crucified in Jesus. We just are humble in our own selves. Isaac Watts, that you would give yourself for such a worm as I? We feel that. And at the same time that you would, you would, you would love me so much. We just want to get low, don't we, before him. And that means, dear friends, that certainly church is not a place for any of us to use as a stage for our own ego. Whoever you are, a musician, the preacher, whoever you are, get out of that. Get out of that. Who, who do you think you are? Of course God's given you your gifts and he wants you to use them. But you use them in a self-effacing way that says glory to God alone. And that humility, sometimes we're in small churches and we feel obscure. We feel, I'm just frittering my life away. You're not. You know this God. You are his child. And that's the greatest thing that could ever happen to a human soul. And therefore, whatever your neighbours or the area think, it doesn't matter. You can embrace that obscurity. I'm not obscure to God. He's the one that matters, you see. Many more things, but let's, let's unpack one or two more. What else does this mean? If God is that great, he is to have all the glory. What else is this to mean? It must mean faith, mustn't it? It must mean faith. Faith which overcomes fear. If we look at our circumstances, often we fall into debilitating fear. But if our eyes are on this great God, that fear dissolves. Just turn back to Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through to 21. Speaking about Abraham, God had promised him offspring. And he was old and time was going on. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. There's facing, as it were, the facts. Since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Abraham didn't ignore his situation, didn't pretend it wasn't there. He was aware of his old age, Sarah's old age. But instead of his faith crumbling with time and, you know, as time goes on, him saying to himself, well, this is never going to happen, it's never going to happen. You know, I'm, it was the same this year and now my birthday for the next year and nothing's happened and... You know, that would be the natural temptation, wouldn't it? But instead, it says there, doesn't it? Verse 20, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Well, why was that? Because he had his eyes on God. He, he knew God. Verse 21, because he was fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. And sometimes, as with Abraham, God lets us go right to the limit when it looks absolutely impossible. And then God works. Because then he reveals just how great he is. 
And that's, that seems to be what happened with Abraham. He was pushed to the very limit. But all the time Abraham was holding on saying, no, 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 this God is so great that even on my deathbed, somehow or other, he could still perform, he will still perform what he has promised. Faith. I remember when I first came into the ministry and uh, obviously in God's goodness, the church has grown since then. But it was a smaller church, and I'd left a good job. And I ran into that place where I thought, what am I doing? What's, what's, this, what's this about? And then that whole thought came to me, that God is the one who raises the dead. God is the one who can work in situations that seem impossible, that God can work in, loves to work in situations that other people have written off. See, when I first went to Guildford, the church there, this congregation, was a written off congregation. There were big churches in the town, throbbing with the, pulsating <laughs> with music and all the rest of it. And this congregation, well, everyone said was a, you know, God's passed you by, written off. Are you in that situation? God loves to work in those situations to show who he really is. I got hold of that somehow. Somehow the Lord enabled me to get hold of that. So faith and prayer, of course, we mustn't miss prayer. If God is this gracious, glorious, enormous, sovereign, unsearchable God, then prayer is no chore, but a fabulous privilege <coughs> that through Jesus Christ I can talk to him and he listens. Now, don't get me wrong, of course, yes, our flesh, our fallen nature is still there and opposes prayer. So I'm not saying that, you know, that, you know it's, there's no struggle. Of course there's a struggle to pray. But when we understand what we're really being allowed to do, prayer takes on something wonderful glimpsing the glory of the ever-blessed God beyond our understanding. And he's made a way for me to come into his presence and somehow to use my feeble prayers in his wonderful plans. Oh God, how good you are. How good you are to me. That he would listen to me that he would have mercy on me. This vision of the glorious God, glory to God alone, was rediscovered at the Reformation. And it made men and women of dedication and humility, actually in tenderness, which we haven't mentioned, but faith and prayer and they were beautiful. And that vision, we need to get hold of that ourselves in our time. Glory to God alone. Glory to God alone. Amen. Amen.